So welcome again to Trail Red TV. My name is uh, Ian McNay and my guest today is Roger Greenaway. Hi Roger. Hi there. And this is another in our series, My Adventures in Music. And Roger's ex had extraordinary success over the years as a songwriter. He's written, I think, 63 songs. Uh, that have been hit singles, most of them co-writes with other people. And I first, first met Roger many years ago when I used to work at Bell Records and he had some very big hits with the American group, Harmony Group, called The Drifters. But Roger started to write songs way before that. And we're going to start off with what you've just told me, Roger, how when you were a teenager, you kind of had two careers that you were drawn to. There was music, which you loved, and also football, which you were really good at. And you lived in Bristol at the time. Yes, I did, yeah. And you had a trial for Bristol City. Well, no, I was scouted. I was scouted, captain of yeah. my local football team, Soundwell. And a scout uh, came up to me one day and said, uh, would you be interested in signing for Bristol City? And of course I did. So I played in their Colts team for two seasons. Right. And at the same time, of course, I got to, uh, I had uh, worked at a company in Bristol called ES&A Robinson and was offered a job in their main office in Park Street, uh, uh, Redcliffe Street, sorry, in Bristol, to um, train as a, a representative. Uh, so I always wanted to sing as well as play football. Those were my two passions. And I met the other two guys in the postal department at Robinson's, who started at the same time as me, Tony Burroughs and Roger Max. And they used to harmonize while they were sorting the mail. <laughs> And uh, one day I, st I started to sing with them and harmonise with them and uh, that's how the Kestrels started. And that was your, the first group you were in, as you say, was a harmony group? Well, we were first called the Bell Tones, but we right. eventually became known as the Kestrels. Right. And did you get a record deal straight away? How no, the... no, no. We, we used to play local clubs, lo canteens and in, in, in local factories as well. Did a few radio spots, local West of England radio spots. And we entered a contest at the Bristol Hippodrome when a gentleman called Carol Levis, the Carol Levis Discoveries, came for the week. And we entered a contest and we won that contest and were invited onto his TV series, which we didn't win. We came second in the TV series. But then we, were, um, we got a record contract. A, 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 a lord called Lord Donegal decided to sign us to his label. And it, we, the first record we made with him was not a hit. It was an EP, four songs. And Roger Maggs, our leader, then had written the songs. Um, and, um, but it wasn't a hit, as I said, but a guy at Pi Records heard that EP and bought our contract out. And so we started recording for Pi. And then you went on the tour with Helen Shapiro as the main act. Yep. And Kenny Lynch. Kenny Lynch. And a young group called The Beatles. There was <laughs> Yeah, they were supporting Akit the Sun, which is um, incredible. Um, yeah, but they were only on the coach for two weeks. With, in, you know, by then they had a couple of hits and it, it was they just had Love Me crazy. Do and Please Please Me. Please yeah. Please Me. It was just Yeah, but you told, me, you told me on the phone, you're on the coach together. Kenny Lynch, this day, the Castrols, the Beatles. This day we were on the coach and uh, the, uh, Paul and John were sat at the back. And Paul had his bass and, and it, was just, it was just his bass. John didn't have his guitar with him. And Kenny Lynch was sat at the back, and I was up the front of the coach. And uh, suddenly we heard this noise coming from the back. I said, I'm not going to sit here while you're writing this crap. And Kenny Lynch came up to the front. And yeah. of course, the, next, the song they were writing was an, became a number one hit. Yes. It was a funny story. But they kind of, in their way, and kept, because the Kestrels, you weren't writing songs, were you? I wasn't writing songs then. No. But they, I think, were one of the people that encouraged you to think about writing. They certainly did. I, um, I used to stand at the side of the stage every night and, uh, and listen to the Beatles. It, you know, it was difficult to hear them because of the screaming. But I was interested in, 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 in what they were doing. And um, it suddenly occurred to me that maybe I could write songs as good as they did. <laughs> of course, I couldn't. But it, you know, it gave me the impulse to start writing. And then you wrote your first, or your first successful song, you wrote in a dressing room in Cleethorpes. Um, if you're talking about You Got the Troubles, before You Got right. the Troubles, yes. um, I had written a song. Uh, we were in the cabaret, at, uh, the Kestrels were in cabaret at a club in Darlington. And I'd written a song called uh, 
um, everything in the garden, which got me my first publishing contract okay. with Mills Music. And um, that song was recorded by Petula Clark as an album track. Tony Hatch was her producer. And he also recorded it as a single with a guy called Jimmy Justice. Right. It wasn't a hit, but it gave me my first taste. And then uh, a couple of months later, after writing that song, Roger Cook joined our group. Yes, but when you wrote that first song, how did you get the idea for the song? Well, it was a very wet, rainy day in the afternoon, and the other three had gone to the cinema, and uh, a film I'd, I didn't wish to see. So I picked up my guitar. Because you hadn't really had a training as a musician, had no, you? No, no, I, I, I actually, during the summer season in Blackpool, I bought a guitar and a guitar chord book, hired yes. a piano for the season, and by the end of that season, I was able to strum, strum a guitar play chords on a, on a piano, enough to write songs. Okay. And so that gave me, you know, that gave me the knowledge I needed to put chords to the melodies I had in my head. And anyway, that's how I wrote that song. I picked it up and um, I was so depressed that day and uh, it was an ode basically to my wife. Okay. And as I said, it's everything in the garden. But when Roger Cook joined us, uh, within a couple of so weeks... So he, he joined joining, the Kestrels? He joined the Kestrels, yes. yes yeah. he was, uh, joined us from Brist from Bristol, where he was playing the Sheriff of Nottingham in, in, in a pantomime with Mike yeah. and Bernie Winters. But I convinced him to, to come and join us, which he it did in the It was a talented post room, wasn't it, that company? It, pretty good. Yeah. It was pr pretty good. Um, and anyway, Roger joined us, and within a, literally a couple of months of him joining us, um, Tony Burroughs, one of the other guys in the group, um, decided he was going to leave because he wanted to, he was offered a contract, a solo contract. Uh, with Deco Records, which he wanted to take. So I, th I figured maybe it was time for us to split. We'd had five great years together and go my own way. And I was very embarrassed for Roger Cook because he'd brought his family up to London. And I felt, you know, I needed, I owed him something. And I knew he wrote songs. So I said to him, look, Roger, maybe we can write songs together. I'll get you a deal with Mule's Music, which I did. And we were doing backups on sessions as well for other people. So if we do back up, we can make a living and just see how it goes. And literally, the last six weeks of work with the Kestrels, we were on tour with Herman's Hermits, right. Peter Noon. And two weeks into that tour, Roger Cook and I wrote, you got your troubles, I've got mine. Yes. We went back to London during a break, made a demonstration disc of that song. But you told me you wrote the song in less than an hour. Less than an hour, yeah. Yeah, just yeah. in the dressing room. I already had the title and I had the verse, but, but Rod, yes. we sat down with Roger and it was literally within the hour it was written. Yeah, so you tend to get the title first for a song and you build the, you get a few verses and then you get the melody comes later, is that right? Most of the time we started with a title, yes, mm. or just, you just, uh, maybe a verse, a verse with music to it. And then you develop it. Yeah, you sit with your co-writer, and if he likes it, you, you progress. And you, so you both sit there with, sit with your uke strumming away. Yeah, yeah, yes. Ukuleles and you strum, and you just see what comes out of it. It develops. Yeah, hopefully yeah. you get inspiration. The, I think most hit songs are written very quickly, um, especially you know once you've got the basic of the lyric and you've got the melody finished. Sometimes you have to sweat the lyric. It takes time to finish the lyric. Mm. But, you, you know, I think most of our hit songs were written within an, an hour, two hours. So you get your first hit, um, goes to number two. Yep. Uh, and there's a big hit in America as well. Massive it must give you, it gives you a big boost. It did. It, well, a lot of confidence. Yeah, when we came off that tour with, uh, uh, with Herman's Hermits, we, our first stop was our publisher, Mills Music. And Tony Hiller, the guy that signed us, said, sit down, I want so I've got something to play you. And uh, so we sat down and he played us this record of the fortunes. And I must have looked a bit disappointed because he said to me, said, but what's wrong, Roger? And I said, nothing's wrong. That's, that's a great record. But I was hoping that we'd have a big American act singing that song. Yeah. He said, don't worry, that's going to be a hit. And that's going to be your first hit. But when you first wrote it, did you feel it would be a big hit? I thought we had something. I wasn't mm. sure, but I, I did think it was it, it was it was a possibility. And you were how old at the time? Twenty six. Twenty six. Okay. Mm. Yeah. And Roger Cook was twenty four. He's two years younger than me. And you've got your troubles. Did yeah. you have troubles at the time? Was that what inspired the well, title? Well, yeah. It came from a conversation 
somebody said to me, when well, you've got your troubles, I've got mine. And uh. lo lots of songwriters, they get their, get their titles from conversations or from reading the papers or from listening to television so or radio. So it kind of stuck on your head and you thought... Came, as soon as I heard it, I'm going to write that down again. Yeah. That's a great title for a song. Yeah. And then, well, after that, for your own career, you were in David and Jonathan. Well, because of You Got Your Troubles, yes. Tony Hiller had not only played that song to the guy that produced it at Decca, Noel Walker, with The Fortunes, he'd played it to several other producers, amongst whom a certain George Martin. Right. And George had said to Tony, he said, I, I really like the song, but I also like the sound those guys make. Do you think they'd be interested in meeting with me and of course Tony said I'm sure they would so we fixed a meeting for us to meet with George Martin yes. who just left EMI and started his company with three other major producers this was called it. Air London that's Air right London. he had Air yeah. Studios Air, too. Had yeah. Air Studios yes. as well and so we met with George and um, he said I like the song guys but obviously uh, you know if the fortunes record is coming out but I really like the way you sing would you be interested in sing you know singing for me being one of my artists on my new label and you can imagine how we felt. I mean, George Martin, Beatles producer, asking us if we'd like to record yeah, for him. Yeah. So it was, you know, of course we said yes. And oddly enough, the first song that we recorded is, uh, David and Jonathan was a name that Judy Martin gave us because she, she was in, in, so into religion and she found it in the Bible. This is his wife. It was George Martin's right, wife, okay. Judy, yes. Yeah, yeah. Gave us that name. So it was David and Jonathan. George had just finished an album with the Beatles. And on that album, there was a song called um, Michel. Michel, yeah. Which um, he assured us the Beatles were never going to release as a single. And George thought it was a hit. So that was the first song we recorded as Dave and Jonathan uh, with George. And of course it was a hit. Went to number seven in the, in the UK and was a big hit in America as well. Yes. Um, but So that's how we became David and Jonathan with The second song that we recorded, we, we'd always wanted. So did, did that give you a degree of fame as such when you have one hit single? Well, is that it, give was, you? It, it was the first time that we'd ever had a hit as, as an act in our own name. Yes. Kester was uh, produced over a dozen singles and a couple of albums, but never had a hit. So as artists, it was the first time we'd had a hit as artists. Yes. Which was um, something we wanted to do, but we also very much wanted to have hits with our own songs as artists, you know, which we'd never done before. So the next song, that we recorded with George was a song called uh, Lovers of the World Unite, which was written by Roger Cook and myself. And that did that, you know, that fulfilled our dream of having a song of our own uh, uh, under yeah. the name of uh, our own name. Yeah. And where did the idea from that come from? I don't remember where it came from. I think we were on a coach at the time. And then Roger Cook came up with this, he had this riff I mean, it was a. <laughs> inspired me so we wrote them lovers of for a couple of years with David and Jonathan but uh, by the end of that two years I was we were writing hits we were uh, was we were produce, producing records as well we had our own so, publishing so company. what was the sequence which other songs did you write after that well after that um, as David and Jonathan we wrote a song called uh, softly whisper I love you which sold very well in California but that was the only place that it mm. sold it was not a hit and that was what persuaded me that maybe it was time for me to come off the road and start concentrating purely and simply on writing songs. But I'm a persistent devil, and I was sure Softly Whispering I Love You was a hit. And uh, so I took it to one of George's partners, John Burgess, who was you know, one of the top producers in today, and played it to him, and he said he agreed with me, he did think it was a hit. And that, uh, about a month later, by now I'm working in the offices at George Martin's company, running Marabus Music, as well as Kukume Music, our okay. own company. 
and I used to see John Daly and I went in uh, one day and he said I'm just signing, signing an act called Brian Keith he's got a, a kind of a, a Joe Cocker voice and uh, I'm gonna the first single is gonna be softly, softly whispering I love you I thought that's fantastic the day after the session I'm in the office and I said how did it go and John said the, the track was fantastic but it's not right for Brian so that was it a couple of months go by and I'm having lunch with John uh, at a local restaurant and he says um, do you know what Rog I think softly whispering could be a hit as an instrumental and I said well I, I really don't see it as an instrumental John but I'd be more than happy for you to record it as such and he hired a guy called Alan Parker who was one of the top session players of the day and he put Alan's guitar on the track so again I go in after the session the next day say how did it go and he said um, you were right <laughs> it's not it's not an instrumental hit and then a couple of more months go by and John tells me he's about to sign an act with EMI a Welsh choir and he said I think I'm going to have another bash you know softly whispering with this Welsh choir which I was elated by because I really thought a Welsh choir would be perfect for that song and as and the other two occasions I'll see him the next day after the session and how did it go and he says uh, it, you know it didn't work <laughs> and that was it about another six months go by and John's in the studios at EMI cutting Ken Dodd a single with Ken Dodd and he says to the engineer during a break the engineer was Jeff Emmerich who did all the Beatles sessions Jeff get out the 16 track of Sophie Whispering and run me off a quarter inch tape because I want to hear it again still believe it's a hit so Jeff gets out the 16 track and he's running all 16 tracks down onto a quarter inch tape so you could hear Brian Keith's voice Alan Parker's guitar and the choir and all and the orchestra all at the same time which he'd never done before and suddenly he thought do you know now it sounds like a hit so he booked a session a couple of days later went in remixed it with Brian Keith's voice at the front Alan Parker's guitar coming in later and then joined by the, the the Welsh right, Choir, yeah. released it under the name of the English Congregation and it was a massive hit. Yeah. So two years after having a miss with Dave and Jonathan, because of persistence, it became a big hit. It was not only a big hit here, because it was so big here. In America, a guy called Mike Curb, he called it the Mike Curb Congregation, recorded the same song and it was a big hit in America. And in the late 80s, Paul Young recorded it again and had another hit with it. Yeah. It went something like this. Do you want me to do a little bit of this? Yeah. It went some. Softly whisper me I love oh. Softly whisper me I love you. I've forgotten the... Uh, <laughs> Don't worry. You know, the, I remember the song straight away. Yeah. Echoes of yours go still through my dreams Softening the chill of the breeze through my window I can see the moon glow painting silver shadows on a rose-colored land a world that we walked hand in hand in a day of gold colored by the glow of new love and so on yeah so you at this time you were writing songs what every week or every two weeks because you had a very prolific period we didn't did you? we had one year where we had 11 hits in one year and in the second year was nine we had nine hits yeah and we for those two years we we got the Ivor Novello award for songwriters of the year two years in succession and which were the really big songs at that time that you wrote oh something's got a hold of my heart for Gene Pitney because um, you, you told me on the phone there that when he originally heard that, Gene really liked it, but he and he had his band or he had musicians yep. create create a track for him, but it didn't work out, so they used ended up using your demo. That's exactly what happened. He he went in three times to record the song and um, his manager in, in London at a guy called Jerry Brown, who we'd played the song to, and um, Gene tried very hard he, and he rang Jerry and he said, I love the song, but I just can't get the feel that there is on the demo. Would you think the guys would let me have their demo track? Which of course we did. It was recorded at Regent Sound in Denmark Street. 
we gave him the demo track and he had it, some strings and, uh, and girls' voices and the rest is history. Yeah, it was a big hit for him. Massive hit and yeah. recorded again in the late 80s by Mark Allman. And, course, and when Gene yeah. did it, it was number four in the charts. And, but when Mark did it, it got to number one. Yes. It was massive in Germany. It was yeah. number one in Germany. Yeah. It must be so rewarding when you write a song um, and not only is it hit once, it's a hit twice, twice or even three times. Is well, that's the great thing about having certain songs that we call legacy songs, catalog, catalog songs. Um, they get recorded and recorded again, not so much these days, but in those days, you, yes. you get 20 covers. We still get covers on some of our old songs. Yeah. And then you, you, you wrote songs for the Hollies. How did that come about? There was um, Long Cool Woman in a Black Dress, dress and yeah. Gaslin Alley Bread. Well, I didn't have much to do with Long Cool Woman, Long cool woman in a Black Dress. It wasn't a hit here anyway, but it was number one in America. Still oh, I classic, remember it well, it? yeah. Yeah, it was number one in America. And still is the classic rock today. It's still, you know, it's like a small pension for us. It was mostly written by Roger Cook and Alan Clark. And a couple of other hymns, we did Gasoline Nanny Bread with Tony McCauley. Yes. So you, at that point, you were working with other people as well, not just Roger Cook. I was, both he and I was, were writing with other people. We, we both wrote with Albert Hammond, in my case, I would. Um, and uh, we wrote with Jerry Lorden. We had a hit with Scylla with Jerry Lorden, with Congratulations. Uh, which led us also to, you know, writing Scylla's uh, the second uh, series that she did, TV series. We wrote the theme for that. So um, how, how did you, you know, you, you talked about you wrote songs when you when you're on the road, but when you stopped working as a musician as such, you how, how did you discipline yourself? Did you get up in the morning and think I'm going to write a song today and sit down with Roger Cook or whatever? What was your kind of structure for write for writing songs? Well, we, we didn't work on songs every day, but we would book times to meet so we could write songs. You know, maybe a couple of three days a week and generally he would have a little piece of something unfinished or a, a title and I would have the same and we would play each other what we each had and if something struck with both of us we'd finish it then as a song that's how we worked and are you saying earlier that most of the songs were written pretty quickly they were nearly all the hits were written pretty quickly some yeah. Roger wouldn't sweat a lyric if we were struggling with the lyric, you know, we'd almost finished it, but we needed a couple of lines. He'd just say, Rog, let's, let's knock it on the head. We'd finish six or seven o'clock in the evening, having started at 10 o'clock in the day sometimes. Yeah. And sometimes we'd write, we'd write more than one song in a day, of course. And he would just go home and the next day he'd ring me up and he'd, 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 had the, he'd finish that lyric before he'd gone to bed, you know. Yeah. It worked like that sometimes. So during this time, I'm just looking at some of the ones that you also Right, you mentioned something tells me yeah. something's going to happen tonight by Scylla Black. Where, do, where, where did the idea of that song come, that song come um, from? Scylla had finished her first TV series um, and her producer for that TV series was a guy called Michael Hurl in the BBC. And we'd had a, Scylla had recorded at least five or six of our songs. And as I said, we'd had a hit with Congratulations and um, she was about to embark on the second TV series. And Paul McCartney had written the theme for the first series, Step in Sidler. And I got a call one day in the office from Michael Hurl. And he said, Roger, um, Scylla loves you guys. and we're, we're just about to start the second TV series. And we were both wondering if you and Roger would care to write the uh, theme for the next TV series. <laughs> of course we would. We'd be delighted, Michael. And he said, well, why, why don't we meet for lunch, come to the BBC, and I'll explain to you um, how I see the opening of the show going. And so we have lunch with Michael and um, he says, look, Scylla's going to start right at the back of a stage, almost in silhouette. She'll be almost in, in darkness, in silhouette. I want her to walk slowly forward, so I want just something rhythmic to start with. And then she'll walk into a spotlight. As soon as she hits the spotlight, everything must, something has to happen, something big has to happen. She will start singing, all the lights will go up. And by saying that, he gave us the title, Something's Going to Happen Tonight. Right. Yeah. But we added, you know, something tells me before that, Something's Going to Happen Tonight. And we went away and we wrote this. Oh. Something tells me something's going to happen tonight. I read in the papers in jam and I think we will make it tonight. The stars will be shining, my sign is a 
it was a hit yeah. we got to appear on Silla's show the two of us as well so yeah no I love the way you just take the I take the phrase and it kind of it germinates something and then there's a yeah. song well words yeah. always suggest music yeah. to me always. yeah yeah now with Blue Mink you were quite involved with the beginning of Blue Mink I oh, think yeah. yeah yeah well by then we were writing for five years we wrote commercials for Coca-Cola it started with the with the fortunes and we worked with people like Ray Charles, Bobby Goldsborough, The Vogues, Tremolos here, um, The Trogs, New Seekers, White Plains, of course, and, and so on. We did loads of commercials for them. And I was in the studios one day with Reg Presley. Right, the Trogs, yeah. Of, of yeah. The Trogs, um, recording this 60-second this 60, 60 or two-minute commercial for Coke. And I don't know what, Roger wasn't with me that day. I don't know why, he's probably somewhere else producing something. And during the break, uh, the drummer, Barry Morgan, came up to me and he said, Roger, you, um, Alan Parker, the guitar player, Herbie Flowers, the bass player, and Roger Coulomb, the piano player, they were all top session players, were just forming a new group. And we were wondering if you'd care to be our lead singer. And I said, well, I was very flattered. It's such, you know, excellent musicians would want me to be their lead singer. But... Um, I, had a, I was too busy, I just couldn't do it. I said, Barry, I couldn't do it. But I knew that Roger Cook would jump at the chance if he were asked. And as pure luck would have it, the next day Roger Cook and I had been booked at Top of the Pops to back one of the acts. And that same quartet were the, were the rhythm group for the orchestra at Top of the Pops. So we were all going to be at the BBC studios the next day. And I said to Barry, if you ask Roger, then I'm sure he'll say yes. And so they did. And Roger said, yes, he joined. And it was Roger that uh, convinced um, the guys to, uh, that they should add a female vocal, vocalist to the group. And they asked Madeleine Bell, that wonderful black American singer, yes. if she would join. And of course she did. And it was obviously the, the first song. That they called themselves Blue Mink. The first song that they would record was a song called um, Melting Pot, which yes, was written by right. Cooking Greenaway. Yeah, yeah went something a little like this. Take a picture, white man. Wrap it up in black skin. Add a touch of blue blood. became a big hit so lyrically did you write that with Blue Mink in, in uh, we did yeah the, the, so we, we often wrote just for ourselves we weren't thinking too much about other people when we wrote songs but in that instance of course we had a vehicle yes with Blue Mink yeah and you had a lot of other big hits with them went Good on and wrote a few more hits with Good them Morning yeah. Freedom and Banner Man and yeah. Banner Man and yeah. with Herbie Flowers yeah yeah and then um, you also wrote another song that I didn't realize you wrote was Blame It On The Blame It On The Pony Express, which was recorded. Tony McCauley. With, you wrote with Tony McCauley, yeah. yeah. It was a big hit for Johnny Johnson and, and, the, and the bandwagon, yeah. And, yeah. and in a way, that's a bit of a different song. For me, that's a bit of a different song from the other ones that yeah, you... Yeah, it, it basically, Tony had that idea. Um, he had the first verse and, and, and the title. And we sat together one day and he said, you know what, we're going to have to do some... Uh, some, some revision on this. We're going to need to look at our facts about certain things. So we talked about the Pony Express, of course. And so I've I'm, I'm got an encyclopedia <laughs> and found that the Pony Express only ran, it ran for less than a year. It went from St. Joe to San Francisco, you know, and it didn't last more than 10 months because the writers, the, the writers that 
delivered the mail and used to get shot by the Indians. Yeah, that's right, yeah. So that's in the song, it's a bit of history in the yeah. song. But, yeah. So we researched the lyric and, and, and put some authentic stuff in there. Yeah. And then, kind of, there's a fascinating story, your, your biggest ever selling record. You wanted to talk us a story of that one? You're talking about, I'd like to teach the world yeah, to sing. Yeah, New Seekers, yeah, because that kind of, that really had a kind of, Adventure in itself, didn't yeah, it? Yeah, it was. It's, it's, it's a long story, if you forgive me. Um, that was the uh, last song that we ever wrote for Coca Cola, um, and it was called "I'd Like to Teach the World to Sing," but it wasn't originally written as "I'd Like to Teach the World to Sing." Um, Billy Davis, one of the account execs at uh, McCann Erickson, did come in to write. We were about to write a two-minute radio commercial for. Um, the New Seekers. And Bill Backer, the other account is that had got stuck at New York Airport and was, he was, had to go to Shannon. So he was a day late coming into London. So, and Roger was up north somewhere with Blue Mink. So Billy and I sat down and, and we had a start of a melody, Roger and I, we'd written on holiday in, Port in Portugal. We just had about eight bars, which I remembered. And I played it to Billy and he said, he liked the melody. So we then finished a song called True Love and Apple Pie. And the next day, Bill Backer comes into town and Roger's back from the north. So we're all four of us sit down and Billy and I play Bill Backer, who's the main account exec on Coca-Cola especially. We play him True Love and Apple Pie and he says, I love the melody guys, but that, we're, that lyric will never work for Coca-Cola. So it was then rewritten as I'd like to teach the world to sing. Now teach this word to sing um, uh, was recorded with the New Seekers. It was a two minute radio commercial. Um, to me, it's still an unfinished song because we had a middle eight in True Love and Apple Pie, but because it had to be two minutes long, we did we booked bridges in I'd Like to Teach, but we didn't put the middle eight because it would have been too long. Anyway, we record it with the New Seekers. It goes on air, in uh, on radio in America. It's on air for three months and nothing happens. And that's the end of it. Um, about six months after that, a guy called Harvey Gabor, who produced all the TV commercials for Coca-Cola in America. He also worked at McKenna Erickson. He came to Bill Backer and he said, Bill, I've got this idea of a commercial with young, young men and women up on a hill holding a bottle of Coke in their hands and singing in an anthem. I need something anthemic. Is there anything you've ever recorded you think might fit the bill? So Bill Backer said to Harvey, Harvey, there's the tape library. Why don't you go in and listen? There's 10 years of music there. Why don't you go in and listen? Harvey was in that studio for three days and he finally came out brandishing a piece of tape. And he said, I found it, Bill. I think I've got it. And Bill says, what is it? And he said, I'd like to teach the world to sing. Fine, Bill says, OK, that's the new seekers. Yeah. So anyway, Harvey um, gathers his crew and he comes to London because it's cheaper to produce it here. And unfortunately, it rains nonstop for four days, as it can do in London. So Harvey's now panicking. So he decides he needs a day of sun. So he books to go to Rome, takes his crew to Rome, you know, all the seven hills. He finds a hill in Rome. And he's shooting this day with all the kids on the hill with the bottles. He's got three cameras at the base of the hill, a helicopter going around taking the air shots. Now, because he's producing from the foot of the hill, they devise hand signals so that the kids can understand what they want them to do. One of the hand signals gets misconstrued. The kids think it's the signal to come down the hill and get refreshments. So they all start running down, stampeding down the hill. Helicopter in the air wonders what's going on, starts to spin, lands very badly, and, and it doesn't crash, but breaks the helicopter. It, it, it makes it ineffective. Kids smash into two of the cameras, smash two of the cameras as they're running down the hill. So now Harvey has chaos. Manages the next day to get everything. It's another helicopter in the air. Gets there, it gets a commercial shot and goes back to New York. By the time he's got back to New York, he's told by another of the account execs, Harvey, you've gone $250,000 over budget. And I was just, well, you know, the helicopter was broken and the kids smashed the cameras and I had to go to Rome. 
And they said, well, sorry, um, $250,000 is a lot of money today. But in the 70s, it was a lot of yeah. money. And Harvey was sacked. Notwithstanding his sacking, the commercial goes on air, uh, on TV, and within a week, the main head office of Coca-Cola Company, which is based in Atlanta, Georgia, had received over 10,000 letters asking where people could access the music. So they knew they had something special. 10,000 letters is Over 10,000 within a week, yeah. on air. And uh, as luck again would have it, because my life is about luck, um, the New Seekers were performing at the Regis Hotel in New York. And Billy Davis, of course, was worked in New York. So we rushed them into the studios in the afternoon and produced the single. There was already a single in the charts at that time by a group called the Hillside Singers. They'd copied it off, off, off the television, but it was the New Seekers version that went into the charts. And of course, it was released here. And it was t uh, my plugger went round the BBC and uh, every BBC producer except one said that, that would never be a hit. Yeah, interesting, isn't but it? Of course, as soon as it went on television, yeah. we were doing 150,000 records yeah. a day. It sold a million in less than 10 days. So can you show, show the comparison well, of the original yeah, song? Yeah, I'll, I'll play a little bit of Teach the World and then I'll play yeah. a little bit of, of True Love and Apple Pie. Yeah. I'd like to buy the world a home, furnish it with love, grow apple trees and True Love and Apple Pie went something like this. Don't promise me no diamond rings or castles in the sky. Cause all I need is your true love, true love and apple pie. And now the middle eight. Oh, too high, a sweet, sweet home where rambling roses climb. In the summer time, and in the winter time, we'll be warm and cozy by the fire. The kids, the dog, and I, and you can have your parts decide. True love, true love, and apple pie. So do you mourn the missing of the middle eight? <laughs> I, do, I do slightly, because as I said before, it's uh, Teach the World to Sing is what I call a two-thirds finished song. Yeah. It really didn't make any difference. The public loved it. It was a big yeah. hit. And it's basically an iconic commercial now. Yeah, and you were telling me again on the phone that at one point you had, I don't know if it's with, with the new Seekers Day, you had a number one, a number two, a number four single, and you were selling a million million records a week. In a, in a week we did, yeah. We had yeah. Uh, Seekers at number one, would teach the world to sing. Yeah. We had number two with Stella Black, number four with uh, uh, Andy Williams. Right. Yeah. yeah. That song was um, Home Loving Man. Yeah. And we also had 28 with The Fortunes. With, uh, uh, with them. They, they were coming back in the charts. Yeah. I think it was Freedom Come, Freedom Go. Yeah. yeah all at Christmas. Yeah. We had a real bumper Christmas that year. You must have felt on top of the world, uh, kind of, because every time you switch on the radio, you probably hear one of your songs. Yeah, it was, it, well, it was surreal. I mean, you, you know, it, I, I remember a, a BBC producer, t uh, uh, Paul Williams, saying to me, um, you guys are up there with the Beatles now. And I said, well, of course not, we're not, but uh, it, uh, it felt like, like that for a while. Yeah. And then when I first met you, you were working with the Drifters and you were producing them as well, weren't you? Because yep. the Drifters had been a really big act. In the 60s, it, basically, yes, yeah. Yeah, very big. And uh, Johnny Moore was, I think, the only original member he was. From, the, from the Drifters. And then you wrote a song called Like Sister and Brother, yes, which helped bring them back again. And you had some more hits with them as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, when I was asked if I'd care to produce the Drifters, and they were coming over to work in the UK. Um, the, 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 the chance of producing a voice like Johnny Moore was a no-brainer for me. 
I loved his voice. I bought their records back in the 60s. And um, the first album we, we produced in, in, in New York, I decided to go to New York, their home territory, and produce them there. And Jeff Stevens and I had written a song called Like Sister and Brother, which would not have suited Johnny's voice in any way, shape or form. And I figured if I was going to get them back in the charts, certainly in the UK, I need to do something slightly different from what they recorded before. And there was a guy in the group called Bill Fredericks. Bill had a wonderful bass baritone voice. He was just a lovely voice, but was not basically a lead singer. So I decided to cut Bill's voice on that song. So, uh, we did 12 tracks in New York, brought them back uh, to London, as you know, it was released on Bell. And Bell agreed with us that the Like Sister and Brother could be a hit. And we released it and it was a hit uh, with Bill Fredericks. So now I decided that I've got them back in the charts. So I want to stay with the new sound. And Jeff and I had written a follow up called um, I'm Free for the Rest of Your Life, which was then written basically for Bill. And we recorded that, got a lot of play, but wasn't a hit. So now I have a problem. I had them back in the charts and now they flopped with the second record. What do I do? Do I stay with the new sound or do I go back to that old drifters? You know, the, the sound that the, the, the fans loved, yes. the Johnny Moore yeah. voice. Yeah, yeah. And I decided to do that, just that. And um, I sat with Tony McCauley and I, I said, look, I need this song for, um, for Johnny Moore. I need to get the drifters back in the charts. And we wrote a song called Kissing in the Back Row of the Movies. Yes. And by then, um, we weren't recording in America anymore. It was too expensive. What I used to do, I'd record three backing tracks, put my voice on the tracks, send it to the States, they would learn the song, and then we would save time and money in the studios because they were quicker. And I'd recorded two tracks that day with Johnny, and we're about to do this new single, which what I thought was going to be a single with Johnny Moore, uh, Kissing in the Back Row of the Movies. And he comes over to me, Johnny, he says, Roger, I, I don't think I can sing this song. And I said, well, why not, John? And he said, uh, I'm a 45-year-old man, and I can't sing lyrics like when I pick her up from school, and we can't have fun until her homework's done. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, yeah, I see what you mean, John. I said, but do you know, the fans won't care about the lyric you're singing. They'll hear your voice. They hear that great old drifter sound, and that's what that's." It won't make any difference. And, and I promise you it would be a hit. And as I said that, I realized it. I promised him it would be a hit. Now, nobody can promise anybody that a record would be a hit. It was a foolish thing to say. Well, I would have said anything at that point to get him to sing the song. And of course, he, he, he said, OK, Roger, I will sing the song. But if it's a flop, in future, I will decide which songs I sing. Well, I didn't have the courage then to tell him if it was a flop, there wouldn't be any more records anyway. But he recorded the song, as I said, and it was a massive hit. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, it went something like this. Um, Your mama says that through the week you can go out with me. But when the weekend comes around, she knows where we will be. So 
so catchy because really, yeah. I haven't heard that track for a time now. It's such it a went catchy. to number two. Really, yeah. so, and after that, John used to call me the doctor. <laughs> <laughs> he never questioned again anything I asked him to sing. And you actually produced that. Was that, was that a, a hard transition going from just songwriting to producing? No, no, no. We'd started producing back in the 60s. Um, we'd had several hits on Deco, about three with, 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 with um, The Fortunes. Yes. We had a big hit with an instrumental called I Was Kaiser Bill's Batman, whistling Jack Smith on Decca. And we backed many of their top singers, um, uh, Tom Jones and Engelbert. We've been session singers on lots of their records. So I knew the head of A&R at Decca very well, a guy called Dick Rowe. And um, Roger and I wanted very much to produce as well as write, you know, write songs. So I rang Dick one day and said, Dick, you, you know our work. You've, you've heard our demos. You know what we can do. You've had hits with us. If you ever have uh, an act that you need a new producer for, would you keep us in mind? And, and Dick said, oh yes, I w I, he would. And literally again, with luck, uh, uh, about a month later, um, Dick rings me up and he says, uh, we've got this group called the Flower Pot Men. And they'd had a hit with Let's Go to San Francisco. But the follow up was a flop. And their producer was a g another big hit songwriter called uh, John Carter. But John doesn't want to produce them anymore. Would you be interested? And I said, well, of course, we'd love to try. And I knew the lead singer in the Flower Pot Man was my old buddy in the Kestrels, Tony Burroughs. <laughs> so anyway, we, we retuned uh, four songs with them. And in between routining with them and our arranger, Lou Warburton, uh, before doing the session, uh, Cook and I uh, had written a song called My Baby Loves Loving. And I went to see Lou and I said, let's do an, an arrangement of this song. If we get time on the on the flower pot men session, I'll, I'll get a free cheeky demo out of it. So which which he did. And on the session, we'd recorded the four songs, and we had twenty minutes to spare. So we recorded that track with Baby Loves Loving. And over the next couple of days, we put the flower pot men voices onto the other four tracks. And before they'd left the studios, I asked the engineer to play me the backing track of Baby Loves Loving. And Tony Burroughs, the lead singer, said, "Are well, we going to put our voices on that?" And I said, well, it wasn't our intention, but if you like to, he said, well, I, I, that sounds strong to me. I think we should put our voices on it. Thank goodness. And we put their voices on, and then we sent the five tracks up to Decca. In those days, Decca had a, a group of people, six internal people, and they used to get people off the streets during the lunch hours, pay them five quid or something, to come in to listen to possible releases. And they would give them the thumbs down and the thumbs it's up. It's amazing. It's almost yeah. random, isn't it? You come right. in, we well, give you five quid in the sandwich. Course, yeah. And they, they provide <laughs> them be with a and r <laughs> Yeah. And uh, anyway, the committee sat that day, listened to the five songs, and we got the thumbs up for uh, "My Baby Loves Loving." And so Dick rang me and said, uh, "Roger, we 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 think Baby Loves Loving's a hit. Oh, that's fantastic." Um, he said, "But I've second thoughts about the name." I'm not sure, I think Flower Pot Men might be a little passe now. And he traveled to New York regularly and he said there's a place outside of New York called White Plains. And he said, I think that'd be a great name for a group, don't you? And I said, oh, yeah, of course it would. So Baby Loves Loving was put out under the name of White Plains and was a big hit here and in America. So now we were hit producers. From that time on, we started producing other acts. Yeah. I mean, Baby Loves Loving went something like this. I just. I'm Got what it takes for me. 
So the Big select, the selection America, committee said yes, and it was. We a got hit. the hands up from the selection yeah, committee. That's yeah, that's fantastic. That's a, it's, it's about luck, you know. I still say it's ninety percent luck in this business, maybe ten percent talent. You know? oh, I don't know. I think <laughs> I think you also did, did determination. You were doing what you loved as well, which oh, was important. No, that, that was something we had to do. I mean, we, yeah. we didn't really come into the business for money. We, we just had to do it. Yeah. And then you said to me again on the phone that um, you stopped writing about 1986. Yeah. So what actually happened? Well, why did you stop writing? In the, in the 19, yeah, because in, nine, I, in 1975, when Roger left to go to America, um, I joined the board of the Performing Rights Society, which yes. collects money for writers yes, and yes, publishers yeah. in the UK. And um, so you got a real job uh, for the first time. Yeah, it's the only time my mother was proud of me. She, I wasn't <laughs> paid. I wasn't paid, but she said. And then I became chairman in 1983. I was yeah. voted the first writer chairman ever at PRS. And uh, so I, I was the first uh, chairman also to have an office. I, I made a chairman's office there. And over the next uh, four, I did it for four years, and it became a full-time job for me. I loved it. And so I said, my mum was so proud because I was chairman of PRS. She never talked about the songs, but she, her Isn't son that was amazing? chairman. amazing? You wrote all those hits. <laughs> <laughs> no, it didn't mean anything to my mum. I think it did to my dad, but she, she, she wasn't phased at all. And anyway, so during that period, slowly but surely, I stopped writing. Because the time factor, and, and I wasn't getting the kind of ideas I used to get. I was concentrating on yeah. being a good chairman at PRS. Yeah. And then in 19, end of 19, I started three, four, five, six, yeah, the end of six in 1987. I was about, I was going to leave the PRS then, but they convinced me to stay on as a writer director, which I did. And did you, did you miss writing songs at all? No, I, st I still wrote a bit, but I never, I, we used to make demos of everything or, or record it with the acts yeah. we had. But no, I, I still wrote the odd song, but never demoed them. Yeah. In fact, recently, I, I oh, Whilst I was, um, you know, I had the job at ASCAP for 20 years, I, um, I wrote about a dozen songs and seven were complete, uh, finished, and I never had them, I just kept them in my head. And about three months ago, my son, who's a, an arranger and, and conductor and a musician, I said to him, because I was retired then, do you know, I want to, all those songs I've written over the years that I've never demoed, I want to make demos of them. Which we did, so I recorded the seven, I've finished seven songs of demos. Okay. They're there, I've given them to my publisher. Nothing will happen with them because they're, they're what they are. They're, they're retro songs, the songs the we would have written of, of, yeah, period, of a yeah. certain period. Yeah. But yeah, so I still, I'm an, I get the odd idea still. It's an, if I hear words, they just, um, they just uh, suggest melody to yeah. me. You know, it can't help it. Well, wonderful. Our time is virtually up. Okay. Do you want to just play something for a minute before we finish? What, what's your uh, kind of favourite song you've written that you uh, have? My favourite song is the one that started everything off, which is You Got Your Troubles, I Got Yeah, mine. yeah. So I'll play a little bit. Okay, that was really interesting. Thank you very much thank you. for coming in. Thank you. And thank you for watching uh, Cherry Red TV. And I hope we see you again soon. Goodbye. There you go.